NASA's Phoenix lander descended to Mars and detected frozen water beneath the surface. This discovery revealed that Earth was not the only terrestrial world with the potential for life. Throughout history, we have observed our planetary neighbors and sent probes and landers to Mercury, Venus, and Mars, uncovering secrets about our solar system. By studying other planets, we have learned more about Earth and have come closer to the possibility of finding alien life. Each mission has paved the way for future off-world colonies, forever changing alien worlds. Our solar system formed from a giant cloud of gas and dust 4.6 billion years ago. Under the force of gravity, the cloud collapsed and flattened into a disk. In the center, the sun formed with hydrogen undergoing nuclear fusion emitting energy. The planets, including Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, were formed from the leftover material in the disk. Over time, these terrestrial planets accumulated more material and evolved in unique ways. By studying the terrestrial planets, we can learn more about our own history and gain insights into space exploration. Venus, the brightest planet in Earth's sky, has played a significant role in our understanding of the solar system. Galileo observed Venus's phases in the 1600s, confirming the heliocentric model. Venus' opaque cloud tops led to speculation about habitable environments below. The development of the first robotic explorers to Venus brought us closer to finding answers. Venturing beyond Earth's atmosphere poses challenges as spacecraft are exposed to extreme conditions in interplanetary space. Earth's protective atmosphere shields us from extreme temperatures and radiation, but spacecraft must be designed to withstand these factors. NASA's Mariner program, launched in the 1960s, aimed to explore the terrestrial planets, including Venus. However, reaching the inner planets requires slowing down the spacecraft to avoid speeding past them. The Mariner missions paved the way for further exploration and understanding of our neighboring planets. Mariner 2 successfully flew past Venus after a four-month journey from Earth. It revealed a thick atmosphere composed mostly of carbon dioxide, making Venus inhospitable with sulfuric acid raining down from hurricane-speed winds. The planet experiences a runaway greenhouse effect, heating up due to the trapping of heat and increasing levels of carbon dioxide. Mariner 2 also discovered that Venus rotates in the opposite direction compared to other planets. The Venera program initiated by the Soviets aimed to land probes on the surface of Venus. Despite the challenges posed by Venus' environment, Venera 7 successfully transmitted data from the planet's surface for 23 minutes before succumbing to the heat and pressure. Venera 9 later returned the first image from the surface of another planet, revealing a rocky landscape. The success of the Venera program contributed significantly to our understanding of Venus and its hostile conditions. Back the first images of that world, and once that mission had been successful, it was possible to design future missions to adapt to those surface conditions. The Soviets continued the Venera program into the 1980s, sending back even more images and data. These images continue to contribute to our understanding of Venus, although we are only able to observe a few small areas. Instead of focusing on just one small area of Venus, NASA's next mission aimed to map nearly the entire surface. On May 4, 1989, Magellan became the first deep space probe launched from a shuttle. One advantage of launching from a shuttle is that there are humans operating the shuttle who can safely check the instruments before releasing the probe into space, allowing for efficient deployment. Four months after leaving Earth, Magellan began transmitting radar images of the Venusian terrain. Using radar, Magellan was able to penetrate through the thick cloud cover and observe a world covered in volcanoes and lava flows. Mapping Venus revealed its volcanic and seismic activity, as well as its geological changes and renewal of land. Magellan also provided insight into Venus's early history, suggesting that it may have once had an atmosphere similar to Earth's and could have been habitable with liquid water and suitable surface temperatures. However, over time, Venus lost its water due to the sun's radiation, being closer to the sun than Earth. The aging of the sun, combined with the addition of greenhouse gases by humans, still a raises questions about the origins of, of Venus that scientists seek to understand, not only for the sake of exploration, but potentially to learn from and potentially protect Earth's environment. 
Venus remains a fascinating and enigmatic evil twin of Earth, and further exploration is necessary to uncover more of its mysteries. The European Space Agency's Venus Express mission, launched in 2006, made surprising discoveries such as uncharacteristically cold regions high in Venus' atmosphere, where carbon dioxide could freeze into snow. These atmospheric layers offer enticing prospects for astrobiologists, as there is a possibility that Venus' atmosphere could be home to some form of life, although it would be very different from what we know on Earth. Venus will continue to captivate our curiosity with its myriad of unsolved mysteries, ensuring that it retains its allure for years to come. Them so well. Named for the Roman god of messengers, travelers, and thieves, Mercury is the smallest planet in our solar system, located at an average distance of 77 million kilometers from Earth. Mercury is the innermost world and is a tiny planet that is very close to the Sun. The sun's constant stream of very hot charged particles, called the solar wind, has stripped away Mercury's atmosphere a long time ago. However, the gases inside the rocks on the surface of Mercury have created a small helium atmosphere. Mercury experiences extreme temperatures, reaching over 400 degrees Celsius during the day and dropping to negative 200 degrees Celsius at night. Understanding this tiny world is important in piecing together the puzzle of the terrestrial planets. Despite its small size, Mercury is remarkably dense, with its core containing 85% of the planet's mass compared to Earth's 55%. It provides valuable insights into understanding the early days of our solar system. The Mariner 10 spacecraft, launched on November 3, 1973, was the last spacecraft of the program, but the first probe destined for Mercury. To reach Mercury, Mariner 10 employed an interplanetary slingshot maneuver using the gravity of Venus to bend its flight path towards its target. The spacecraft had to make precise rocket burns and course corrections to ensure a successful mission. During its encounters, Mariner 10 transmitted photographs of Mercury, revealing its surface pocked with massive craters. These craters are evidence of early bombardment in the solar system's early formation. Mariner 10 flew past Mercury three times, becoming the cornerstone for future missions across the solar system. It returned over 2,700 pictures, covering nearly half of Mercury's surface. The Messenger spacecraft, launched years later, embarked on a 7.9 billion kilometer journey lasting six years to reach Mercury. It entered Mercury's orbit in 2011, becoming the first spacecraft to achieve long-term orbit around the planet. Messenger's mission aimed to map Mercury's surface, revealing features such as polar regions, craters and shadow for billions of years, evidence of volcanism, tectonic deformation, and ghost craters. The striking images provided by Messenger confirmed the theory that Mercury is shrinking as its interior cools. The heat generated during its initial formation causes the surface of the planet to be pulled inward, resulting in scarred and cracked surfaces. This phenomenon occurs in the late stage of a planet's evolution. Mercury is a peculiar world that deserves our attention due to its unique features and geological processes. The missions of Mariner 10 and Messenger have contributed significantly to our understanding of this enigmatic planet. Dramatic end in 2015. We'd like to end a mission in the most useful scientific way. When the Messenger spacecraft ran out of fuel, it was sent on a final experiment and that experiment was to basically self-immolate on the surface of Mercury. While we can study Mercury from orbit and make some educated guesses about the density of the surface, the best way to do that is to smash the spacecraft into it. Closing in on the Mercurian surface, Messenger was able to collect data on the magnetic anomalies in the crust and ice hiding in the shadowed craters near the planet's poles. Mercury will not be alone for long, in 2018, the joint European-Japanese mission BepiColombo started its journey towards the innermost planet. The missions are designed to have as wide capabilities as possible because we simply don't know the right questions to ask about worlds as unknown as Mercury and Venus. A world half That's the size of Earth fun. hangs as a red speck in our night sky. The outermost terrestrial planet, Mars' orbit lies 78 million kilometers beyond Earth's. In the 19th century, as telescope technology improved, observers began recording fascinating shapes on the Martian surface. Italian astronomer Giovanni Schiaparelli's sketches hinted at extraterrestrial architectures. 
He made observations of Mars and drew maps of its surface, labeling some of the features as canali, channels in Italian, creating excitement that Mars might host other beings. In the 1960s, probes were sent to Mars to separate fact from science fiction. The fourth probe of the Mariner program, Mariner 4, became Mars' first visitor. Over a few hours, Mariner 4 captured 21 complete images and a partial 22nd, but each image would take nearly nine hours to transmit back to Earth. The wait for such a small amount of data was so long that researchers started to color in the pictures with pastels because processing the data would take even longer. The images from Mariner 4 did not reveal a world of extraterrestrial canals as initially speculated. Instead, they showed a desolate landscape of dry rocks, craters, and dust, which was not what the scientific community expected. The variation seen on Earth was not found on Mars, highlighting the uniqueness of water and life. However, Mariner 4's flyby images were only a snapshot, and a more extended mission to Mars might reveal more. The Mariner 9 probe, launched in May 1971, became the first spacecraft to orbit another planet. Its instruments began to unveil the planet we know today. Over nearly a year of operation, Mariner 9 transmitted more than 7,000 photographs, mapping the entire Martian surface. It revealed a world with a flat northern hemisphere, heavily cratered southern hemisphere, and highland regions with mountains. In between, there is an anomaly known as the Southeast Rise, an area with evidence of significant volcanism. Mars' early history reveals an enormous rift valley almost 3,000 miles long, an astounding feature that no one expected on Mars. Mars is also home to the highest mountain in the solar system, Olympus Mons, a giant volcano. It experiences dust storms and weather in its thin atmosphere, making it a very active world. Fossilized riverbeds and mineral deposits that could only have formed in seas and lakes suggest a water-rich past on Mars. Additionally, there are features that indicate the presence of global oceans. Mariner 9 provided the first clues that water once flowed on Mars, revealing that Mars has a past that was water-rich. The Viking landers, two identical craft, facilitated humanity's first close-up examination of Mars. Equipped with a small shovel on the end of a telescoping arm, they analyzed Martian soil to learn about the surface. Viking 1 and Viking 2 landed on opposite sides of the globe. The first photo from the mission was of the lander's foot, providing scientific information about the surface. In addition to collecting photographs and measurements of the surface, the Viking landers conducted three experiments dedicated to the search for life. Scientists were looking for evidence of methanogenic microbes, microbes that emit methane on Mars. While Vikings' findings suggested that the makeup of Mars' soil and solar ultraviolet radiation limited the formation of living organisms, it didn't exclude the possibility that an ancient Mars once supported life. To increase exploration capabilities, the Sojourner rover, a small automated vehicle, was sent to Mars with the Pathfinder mission in 1997. It demonstrated the ability to operate on the planet's surface but had limited mobility. This led to the development of the Mars Exploration Rovers, twin solar-powered robots, each equipped with a laboratory to measure mineral content and other properties of collected samples. Spirit, one of the Mars Exploration Rovers, landed in a crater that showed signs of once being filled with water. It had to travel several kilometers to reach mountains where evidence of water was found in rocks rich in iron and magnesium. The other rover, Opportunity, landed in a crater with sedimentary layered rock material, indicating the presence of long-standing water. Spirit and Opportunity successfully gathered data on the water history of Mars, with Spirit lasting over six years and Opportunity continuing for another nine. While originally slated for a 90-day mission, Opportunity traveled a total of 45 kilometers, surpassing any previous distance covered on the Martian surface. These missions have contributed to our understanding of Opportunity made us Martians. There has been a team of people operating the rover on the surface of Mars. Mars has now become our neighborhood, which can be both cruel and kind. They thought dust building up on the solar panels would eventually block the sunlight and end their mission. However, the whirlwinds on Mars blew the dust away and kept the solar panels clean, allowing the rovers to drive further and continue their scientific work.
However, in 2018, a planet-wide dust storm sealed Opportunity's fate. This massive dust storm covered the entire planet and lasted so long that Opportunity ran out of power. The remaining instruments were still functioning, but without power, they couldn't do much else. The last message from Rover Opportunity was a message from the engineering instruments on board, stating, My battery is getting low, and it's getting dark. After 15 years of operation, Opportunity's mission on the surface of Mars came to an end. The conclusion of Opportunity's operations didn't stop humanity's focus on the Red Planet. The Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, MRO, was designed as the next generation eye in the sky. It captures surface features as small as a meter and carried a telecommunication system that could be used for navigation by other Martian missions. Since its arrival in March 2006, the MRO has circled Mars more than 60,000 times and sent back more data than all previous Mars missions combined. Its powerful camera has mapped 99% of the surface in unprecedented detail, revealing a planet that is still active and changing. Having an orbiting vehicle like the MRO with high-resolution cameras has allowed us to see Mars as an entire world with diverse geology. In fact, the MRO has better maps of Mars than we currently have for Earth. The MRO has identified places of interest to send future landers and rovers in the hunt for Martian water. The Phoenix mission landed near the northern polar regions of Mars and had a digger on board. It detected bright white material just six centimeters below the surface, providing evidence of past water on Mars. The rulers have been investigating the history of water on Mars for almost five years. Phoenix was the first mission to actually touch and taste the Martian water. Water is crucial for human life, so understanding where it is on Mars, how much there is, and how to access it is critically important for potential future missions. While our robotic Martian explorers have not found definitive evidence of life, they have detected methane, a chemical often created by living organisms on Earth. These findings provide tantalizing hints of the potential for life on Mars. The quest to uncover the mysteries of Mars and the search for life will continue with future missions. We still have questions about where the water went, whether it supported life in the past, and if it could support life in the future. Mars, being right on our doorstep, provides a great example of the big questions we have about the universe. Through exploration, we continue to learn more about its transformation from a barren planet to one that once had water and the potential for life. Primordial watery world, our star bears some of that responsibility. In order to comprehend the mechanics of the inner planets, we need to unlock the secrets that drive the solar system. We need to study the sun. The sun creates all the heat and light in the solar system, enabling life on Earth to exist. It has also created extreme environments on the other terrestrial planets. It prevented life on Mercury by stripping away its atmosphere and on Venus by causing the evaporation of all its water and turning it into a runaway greenhouse. Our sun produces its own weather, matter, and light streaming out, influencing every orbiting body to some degree. Every so often, intense flares rise above the surface, ejecting charged particles up to 3 million meters per second. These ejections collide with the Earth. When you see those beautiful aurora, the northern lights or the southern lights that is caused by solar storms, stuff leaving the sun, hitting our Earth's magnetic field, and rubbing it around. Now that's great for pretty pictures, but it also creates radio interference and problems on Earth. The surge creates a geomagnetic storm which heats up portions of the atmosphere and applies drag to satellites. It interferes with navigational systems and induces harmful electric currents in power grids. So, if we want to predict solar weather, we need to understand how it originates. Space-based missions we have, have been to get trained on the sun for decades. But until recently, they've all kept their distance. In 2018, the Parker Solar Probe was launched, a daring mission to shed light on the mysteries of our closest star, the sun. The Parker Solar Probe will arrive within 6.2 million kilometers of the sun's photosphere, what we describe as the surface. It is ambitious because it's going to get so close to the sun, which will be quite a hot place to be. Additionally, there will be a lot of radiation from the solar wind. The probe's instruments will have a shield of their own, two plates of carbon encasing a core of carbon foam. On one side, 
Temperatures will reach up to 1,400 degrees Celsius, but behind the shield, the spacecraft will rest at a comfortable 30 degrees. The ability of the spacecraft to survive the journey for its instrumentation to work and to deal with the input of thermal energy from the sun is quite astonishing. The sun's temperature is one of the peculiar puzzles we seek to solve. As you go closer to the sun, the surface is 6,000 degrees Celsius. But as you move away, the temperature doesn't go down as expected. It goes up dramatically to 2 million degrees Celsius. The Parker Solar Probe will help us test our theories and gain a greater understanding of solar activity. The sun is the engine of our solar system, and the Parker Solar Probe will help us understand more about that engine and how it works. It will enable us to lift the hood of the vehicle for the first time. While humans dream of becoming a star-faring species, the challenges of reaching other terrestrial planets like Mars are many. While it takes a few days to get to the moon, Mars is a completely different challenge. A one-way trip to Mars would take roughly half a year, but a mission that brought humans back home would last two years. The biggest hurdle to start with is, how do we get people to Mars? Never mind getting them on the surface. Those technical challenges are certainly huge, but we have a pretty good history of overcoming that sort of thing. The biggest challenges are going to be the human challenges. Getting their emotionally healthy, physically healthy, that will be a major stepping stone. Communication delays would be considerable, and the delays in getting medical help would be considerable. So those colonies would have to be very much self-sufficient. Crude exploration will require well-planned infrastructure already in place. We need to be thinking about self-sustainable missions and the utilization of resources in situ, things like fuels, water from the planet, and using those to create the things that we need to survive. It turns out that Mars is not an easy place for humans to live on. If we were living on Mars, we'd actually have to live underground because, in addition to the massive storms and cold temperatures, there is no ozone layer. The sun's rays come straight in, and that would cause cancers and other terrible problems in humans. It has all kinds of hazards to do with radiation, as well as the fact that its atmospheric pressure is only about 1% of the Earth's, and its temperature is very low it would not be an easy place for humans to make a home. Laying the first boot prints on Mars will require our brightest minds. There's some amazing innovation that needs to be done. By solving this for things like the lunar mission, there's all this translatable devices and technology and know-how that benefits us back on Earth. We always get benefits by doing this kind of new innovation and not being scared by these big challenges. Before we set foot beyond our Earth, we must answer a fundamental question. Are these worlds meant for us? I think it's a fantastic philosophical discussion. Right now, we can colonize Mars at some point in the future, whether we should or how we do that appropriately. I believe that humanity has the duty to explore, and with that comes the duty of care to the places that we travel. For all we know, Mars might actually have living organisms on it. Until we can say with certainty that Mars was completely sterile, we need to be very careful how we treat Mars and not just look at it as a place where humans can take over. We should step lightly. The moment we step foot on an alien world, we have forever changed it. Unlocking the secrets of the inner planets, humankind learns more about our home. We look at Mars and Venus, our neighbors. In a lot of ways, they are very similar, but different from the Earth, and that will give us clues well, to our own history exploration has our revealed own much. We must continue pushing the boundaries. Exploration is who we are as human beings. We all do it from the moment we're born to the moment we die. Without exploration, we don't advance as a civilization. The question is not if we will venture to these worlds, but when. It's in our nature to explore, to understand, to investigate, and to be inspired by doing so. As the 20th century came to a close, the Voyager 1 probe became the farthest object from Earth forged by human hands. We're really going into the unknown. But nearly 15 years later, it achieved yet another milestone. Our emissary was the first to touch interstellar space. The moment was the crescendo to a saga featuring the solar system's four outermost planets. We have the ignition. In 1977, the twin Voyager probes departed to explore the giants, the gas giant planets like Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune actually form in the first place, 
some of the things that were found were so surprising. They had never been thought of when the spacecraft was being planned. Voyager paved the way for a new era of robotic investigation. It was tantalizing but left so many questions unanswered that we just had to go back. Some distant moons may hold the greatest potential for life beyond Earth. If I had to bet on a best candidate for life in our solar system, I would pick Enceladus. Now we are scouring our system's outermost regions, hoping to discover a new mystery planet. We're looking for a needle in a haystack, but the needle looks like hay. That's why Planet 9 hasn't been found yet, if it is there. Thank you. During the early formation of our solar system, four small rocky worlds assembled where the radiation of an infant sun was strong enough to push away light gases and destroy all ice. But with great... I have corrected the punctuation in the text below. And ices like water and methane were plentiful in this region. Four giants were born, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Through their gravity in the early history of our solar system, these gas giants have vacuumed up all of the available gas. Humanity's curiosity extended to these distant worlds. We'd explore the universe of the solar system. We'd gone to Mercury, who had been to Venus. We'd been to Mars, but the big worlds of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, they really beckoned to the scientific community. An expedition to the giants would require crossing a protoplanetary graveyard, a ring of asteroids leftovers from the solar system's formation. 160 million kilometers beyond Earth's orbit, we had to traverse the boundary between Mars and Jupiter, the asteroid belt. We only had some basic telescopic observations of some of these objects out there, and was it going to be a region of space that we could travel through? In 1972, NASA's Pioneer 10 became the first spacecraft to enter the asteroid belt. The asteroid belt, in our popular imaginings, is a rubble-strewn region of space, with mountainous-sized objects crashing together in slow motion. It's nothing like that. Scientists estimated a 1 in 10 chance that the spacecraft would suffer a serious collision. There's a lot of rock out there, but it is spread over an enormous ring or volume of space. Collisions do occur, but they are not as frequent as you might imagine. Seven months after entering, Pioneer emerged triumphant. Having a spacecraft like the Pioneers extend their reach out into the solar system was again another important stepping stone in our exploration of the universe. By year's end, the probe completed a flyby of Jupiter, using the planet's gravity to escape the solar system. Pioneer 10 remained our most distant spacecraft until 1998. A great deal that is most interesting in our solar system was beyond our reach until Pioneer 10 showed us the way. In the 1960s, engineers at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory noted an imminent alignment of the outer planets. A spacecraft would be able to harness the gravity of each and swing from one to the next, using minimal amounts of fuel. It was recognized that you could do a grand tour, the idea of rendezvousing with more than one planet. But if NASA missed their chance, the alignment wouldn't reoccur for almost two centuries. Voyager was an epoch-making moment in the annals of spaceflight. Twin probes were crafted. Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. Together, they would provide unprecedented access to the outer reaches of our solar system. It was going to be the first time that we had pictures of such incredible detail of those distant bodies. Let's measure these things in great detail. But moreover, they're going to keep going and let's build them for the long term. Let's technology would have to endure the harsh environment of space for decades. The Voyager spacecraft, by today's standards, are quite basic vehicles. They had old television cameras on board not too different from what might have been used in a television studio. Their recording systems were eight-track tape. Nevertheless, the equipment was capable of capturing essential details of the mission targets. The modern ships that sail to the planets are unmanned. They are beautifully constructed, semi-intelligent robots. Each Voyager probe also carried greetings from humanity. The legendary scientist, astronomer, and communicator Carl Sagan decided to send a cultural object along with the scientific missions. On the two voyages, this was the famous Golden Records. I sent greetings on behalf of the people of our planet into the universe, seeking only peace and friendship, to teach, if we are called upon to be taught, if we are fortunate, 
and it is with humility and hope that we take this step. Normally, it's a message for any alien species who have to find them, but actually, it's a message to us as well. I have corrected the punctuation in the text below. Laboratory noted an imminent alignment of the outer planets. A spacecraft would be able to harness the gravity of each and swing from one to the next, using minimal amounts of fuel. It was recognized that you could do a grand tour, the idea of rendezvousing with more than one planet. But if NASA missed their chance, the alignment wouldn't reoccur for almost two centuries. Voyager was an epoch-making moment in the annals of spaceflight. Twin probes were crafted, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. Together, they would provide unprecedented access to the outer reaches of our solar system. It was going to be the first time that we had pictures of such incredible detail of those distant bodies. Let's measure these things in great detail. But moreover, they're going to keep going and let's build them for the long term. Let's see how long they can last. 1970s technology would have to endure the harsh environment of space for decades. The Voyager spacecraft, by today's standards, are quite basic vehicles. They had old television cameras on board, not too different from what might have been used in a television studio. Their recording systems were 8-track tape. Nevertheless, the equipment was capable of capturing essential details of the mission targets. The modern ships that sail to the planets are unmanned. They are beautifully constructed, semi-intelligent robots. Each Voyager probe also carried greetings from humanity. The legendary scientist, astronomer, and communicator Carl Sagan decided to send a cultural object along with the scientific missions on the two voyages, and this was the famous Golden Records. I sent greetings on behalf of the people of our planet into the universe, seeking only peace and friendship, to teach if we are called upon to be taught, if we are fortunate, and it is with humility and hope that we take this step. Normally, it's a message for any alien species who find them, but actually, it's a message to us as humans that we have something a little bit special on our planet that we would like to send out into space. Extraterrestrial life could decipher the instructions to play it. The record would reveal 115 images, 90 minutes of music, and greetings in 55 different languages. We have ignition, and we have liftoff of the Titan Centaur, carrying the first two Voyager spacecraft to extend man's senses farther into the solar system than ever before. Voyager 2 was launched first on August 20th, 1977. This is the most exciting mission that I've ever worked with. We're really going into the unknown. It's going to be one of the most scientifically productive of the planetary missions. Voyager 1 followed two weeks later. In less than two years, each arrived at the first proverbial stop on their grand voyage. The largest of all the gas giants, Jupiter contains two and a half times the mass of our solar system's other planets combined. Formed from all these little globules of matter basically colliding together in the very early days of their solar system formation, the world hungrily swallowed nearby asteroids and comets, bulking its mass even further. Eventually, when it cooled down, it was able to accumulate gases, so now it has the sort of a solid core and then this huge amount of gas around it. Jupiter is truly the king of the planets. It's the dominant force in our solar system, except for the sun. Pioneer 10 had captured our first close-up images of Jupiter, but the Voyagers would expose going even on. more of the planets. And when Voyager got close, they saw a very complex place. It saw weather patterns more similar to here on Earth. One of the key targets, Jupiter's great red spot, is like a tropical cyclone, but huge. And it was first observed almost 400 years ago, just to simply exist so long is fascinating, and it's still not completely well understood. In the 19th century, the Great Red Spot stretched three Earths across, but when the Voyagers visited, it had decreased to two. The scale of Jupiter in particular, I think is one of the more striking reminders of just how small we are when you look at features and realize the entire. Earth can fit within the vast expanse of space. Jupiter is known as the Land of the Giants. Voyager 1 made a groundbreaking discovery of Jupiter's faint rings, which were likely formed by the dust shed by Jupiter's moons. Further investigations revealed rings around every gas giant in our solar system. Jupiter's moons, particularly the four large Galilean moons, played a pivotal role in the history of astronomy. 
The moon Io is an active volcanic world with hundreds of volcanoes spewing sulfur dioxide. Europa, the smallest of the Galilean moons, is believed to have a subsurface ocean, making it a potential candidate for extraterrestrial life. The Galileo spacecraft, deployed in 1989, witnessed the spectacular collision of comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 with Jupiter in 1994, demonstrating the planet's gravitational influence on our solar system. Jupiter's presence has likely shielded Earth from many asteroid and comet impacts. Entered orbit, its probe dropped beneath Jupiter's cloud tops. The Galileo probe was actually able to plunge down through that atmosphere and see if there was water. The probe quickly hurtled to a final measured depth of 180 kilometers. Did it rain from the clouds of Jupiter? What were the temperatures? What were the pressures like? Was there lightning in that atmosphere? And along the way, it discovered all of those things, proving the theories that we had about this dynamic world for the very first time. After loss of signal, the probe was vaporized in 2003 following its 35th orbit. A dying Galileo was steered into Jupiter's atmosphere, meeting the same fate. The craft had not been sterilized prior to launch. This act of destruction would ensure no life, had it survived the journey, could contaminate Jupiter's moons. For the next 13 years, we could only study Jupiter from afar. Ignition and liftoff of the Atlas V with Juno on a trek to Jupiter, a planetary piece of the puzzle on the beginning of our solar system. In 2016, the solar-powered Juno spacecraft arrived and settled into a polar orbit. The purpose of the Juno spacecraft was not to show us the clouds of Jupiter once more, but to actually understand more about what's going on inside the planet. How do gas giant planets like Jupiter actually form in the first place? We don't know how big worlds like that actually get built. On each of its highly elliptical orbits, Juno passed Jupiter with only 8,000 kilometers to spare. This is akin to skimming around a basketball just one centimeter from the surface, but which we're doing this tens of thousands of kilometers per hour. Now this allowed us to understand what hides beneath the clouds down to the core itself. We've got a wobbly core in the interior of Jupiter, generating this enormous magnetic field, a magnetic field that is some 20,000 times greater than the Earth. Juno was actually built with a significant shielding just to prevent its electronics being fried by these close approaches. Inside Jupiter, it ceases to be a gas giant. The hydrogen becomes compressed into liquid, and it takes on metallic properties. Juno has helped us understand that structure in incredible detail. As we enter the 1980s, both Voyagers approach their next target, the second largest planet in our system, named after the Roman god of agriculture, the ringed world Saturn. Saturn has been observed in the night sky since antiquity, and its rings were revealed not long after the first telescopes were crafted. When Galileo turned his telescope towards Saturn, he was really confused. No one in humanity knew that a planet could have rings around it. The best he could come up with trying to describe Saturn was that it looked like it had ears. Dutch astronomer Christian Huygens employed a more powerful telescope of his own design and deduced Voyager that Galileo's ear arrived at Saturn months apart. The Voyagers revealed a huge amount about Saturn. They discovered rings that had not been detected from the Earth, rings 200,000 kilometers across but only maybe 10 meters thick on average. They were able to resolve the rings into their component parts, little chunks of rock and ice, dust grains up to boulders as large as mountains, racing around the planet at 80,000 kilometers per hour, with its own strange magnetic field suspending dust particles above and below the rings. In the last day, we have learned a great deal about Saturn's surrounding rings and moons from the dramatic pictures that have been brought back by the Voyager 2 spacecraft. The Voyager's new data on the rings their puzzling origins became a little clearer. The rings of Saturn have been a mystery for many years in terms of how they came to be there. Had they formed with the planet itself, or did they materialize later? Saturn's immense gravity destroying a smaller wayward body, perhaps. It was a relatively recent event in which an ice moon got too close to the planet to stay intact and became broken up into rings. Christian Huygens also discovered Saturn's largest moon, Titan, in 1655. Later that century, an Italian-French astronomer by the name of Jean-Dominique Castagny discovered four more. 
In 1997, NASA, ESA, and the Italian Space Agency launched their joint exploratory mission named after both men, Cassini-Huygens. In many ways, the Cassini-Huygens mission grew out of the Voyager missions because what we saw in the vicinity of Saturn was utterly tantalizing. The mission consisted of two separate spacecraft, the Cassini Pro, which is a NASA project, and the Huygens Pro, which actually came from Europe. These two teams from different sides of the Atlantic could achieve so much more, I think, than either project alone. For me, highlights in the exploration of the outer solar system have to be the Cassini-Huygens probes. We've learned so much about not only Saturn, the beautiful ring planet, its atmosphere, its rings, but also its many, many moons, which are really fascinating. An extraordinary mission, 13 years of absolutely marvelous discovery. Some of the things that were found were so surprising, they'd never been thought of when the spacecraft was being planned. Cassini Huygens arrived at Saturn after a seven-year journey. The first mission to orbit the planet, Cassini provided unprecedented detail of Saturn's rings by flying through them. Mission control had to precisely navigate the craft through the debris. Tensions were high on every pass. What will it encounter as it passes through that ring? What effects will there be on the electronics of the system? Are there particles or small objects with which the spacecraft will collide and be destroyed? That requires some very, very clever use of orbital mechanics. We saw evidence for essentially water falling out of the rings, something like 40 tons per second. The rings themselves are actually raining onto the planet's surface. Cassini was able to observe the first hurricane-like structure on Saturn, the Great White Spot, and watch a hexagonal atmospheric structure at Saturn's North Pole change from blue to gold. The hexagonal feature that sets the North Pole of Saturn is due to a massive hurricane, and it's about 50 times more massive than any hurricanes we get on Earth. Again, there are weather systems like on Earth that there are on these gas giants, something we never would have thought of. On July 19, 2013, the Cassini spacecraft imaged Saturn and its entire ring system during an eclipse of the Sun. One of the most spectacular images it returned was actually from the far side of the planet, looking back towards Saturn with the Sun lining it up from behind. Spanning over 650,000 kilometers, the picture detailed Saturn's second outermost ring, composed of fine icy particles, the ring. The photograph also features a pinprick of light, the Earth, 1.4 billion kilometers away. So they knew that the Earth was going to be in that shot and decided to say to everybody on that day, at that moment, go outside and look towards the skies because your photons will be emanating from the surface of the Earth and received by the Cassini spacecraft. During its mission, Cassini snapped images of many Saturnian moons, but one held the spacecraft's focus. Enceladus, Saturn's sixth largest moon, atop a saltwater ocean buried kilometers below. Close inspection by the Cassini spacecraft showed cracks in that ice and water geysers spraying out from a subsurface ocean. Cassini flew through those geysers and found that the water was warmer than expected and full of organic chemistry. Enceladus is a strong candidate for life in our solar system. Voyager 1's encounter with Saturn's moon, Titan, revealed a world unlike any other. Titan's atmosphere is rich in hydrocarbons and its surface has ice mountains, sand dunes, and river-like features made of organic molecules. Life may form in similar conditions. After 20 years in space, Cassini ventured between Saturn's atmosphere and its rings to learn more about their age. Cassini made 22 dives through Saturn's rings, determining they are between 10 million and 100 million years old. In its final mission, Cassini was sent into Saturn itself for a scientific ending. Voyager 1's journey sent it out of the solar system, while Voyager 2 visited Uranus and Neptune, revealing interesting features of these planets. Voyager 2 studied Uranus's unique atmosphere, influenced by the planet's tilted orientation. Uranus has the lowest temperatures in the solar system, and its distinct coloring comes from methane in its atmosphere. Voyager 2 discovered Uranus has its own system of rings and provided images of the moon Miranda, revealing its unusual features. In its final mission, Voyager 2 reached Neptune, which was discovered through mathematical calculations before being observed. 
Voyager 2 captured images of Neptune's rings, the great dark spot, and studied its moon Triton. Neptune has the fastest winds in the solar system. The Deep Space Network improved communication with Voyager 2 on its journey. Engineering changes allowed Voyager 2 to capture images of Uranus and Neptune. These missions revealed that Uranus and Neptune are vastly different from other planets. Jupiter and very different than Saturn. We kind of had this view pre these missions that the four gas giants were all the same. We saw worlds that had some of the coldest temperatures ever recorded with some of the fastest winds ever moving where the energy for such dynamic systems is still a bit uncertain. We've been sending deep space probes out for decades now. But there's these two planets that we know only from the visit of Voyager 2. We really know very little about these planets, and it's very much overdue. I think that we send back another probe and have another look. We might have a reason to go back, but so many places to explore beyond Earth in our solar system. Where do we go? There's just too much to do. Beyond our outermost planet lies a mysterious realm of small rocky worlds that the voyagers would merely pass through, but they were not forgotten. Four and a half billion kilometers beyond our Earth lies a realm of icy bodies, the remnants of our solar system's formation. The Kuiper Belt is a huge region in the edge of our solar system where the comets live, so it's a very, very mysterious region. Despite its massive size, the Kuiper Belt wasn't discovered until 1992. Within it lies a world once called a planet, Pluto, discovered by 24-year-old Clyde Tomboy in 1930. Pluto was reclassified as a dwarf planet in 2006 following the discovery of several other objects in the Kuiper Belt that were similar in size. However, that has not detracted from our desire to unlock its secrets. The New Horizons probe was developed to expand Voyager's grand tour of our solar system. The New Horizons spacecraft was able to go where the Voyagers couldn't go. They couldn't encounter that final traditional world or solar system, Pluto. The probe embarked from Cape Canaveral on January 19, 2006. There were so many unknowns about Pluto, how it was formed, what it would look like. At a distance of nearly 5 billion kilometers, it would take over 4 hours to send and receive radio signals from the probe. The download speed from New Horizons was only 1 kilobit per second, 50 times slower than the dial-up modems of the 1990s. It took 15 months for all of the information it gathered to return to Earth. Everybody was waking up in the morning ready to download all the latest images that had come in and been processed and were all being put up online. It's just amazing what this meant to all the people that worked on it. Until New but Horizons, it also meant a lot scientists to weren't even sure of the dwarf planet's actual size. They were able to conclude that Pluto is 2,376 kilometers in diameter, the largest of the catalogued dwarf planets. But it was the features on its surface that were truly astounding. A world with nitrogen ice glaciers flowing across its surface into valleys, underneath mountains that were three kilometers high made from water ice covered in a nitrogen snow. The textures and patterns make it look a bit like artwork in places. Surprisingly, it revealed an extraordinary heart-shaped region. A very smooth landscape is a new surface. But by new, I mean within perhaps a million years, certainly not the ancient crater surface that everybody expected to see. As New Horizons departed Pluto, it revealed a naturally blue sky created by nitrogen gas, just like on Earth. Sun shining behind Pluto, lighting up the blue atmosphere and the blackness of deep space that we're traveling out into, leaving behind the worlds of our solar system, heading into the interstellar void. Observations of the outer solar system continue to raise as many questions as answers. Indeed, a number of objects beyond Pluto follow unusual orbits, orbits that could hint at an unseen gravitational force, another planet, currently dubbed Planet Nine. If we look at the other objects in the very outer solar system, some of the asteroids, the rocks that are floating out there, they seem to be pulled a little bit off target. These orbits all seem to line up pretty well in one direction, and that tends not to happen by chance. They could possibly be a very massive planet out there that we haven't yet discovered, Planet Nine, for it to be there and for it to be. Having the effect that it is, it has to be pretty big, somewhere between Earth and Neptune. What we call a super-Earth, 
which is interesting because super Earths are very common around planets around other stars. So one of the most common types of planets in all the other star systems just happens to be the one we're missing. Mathematical modeling and computer simulations hint at Planet Nine's existence, but has yet to be observed directly. Now, a Neptune-sized object would be quite big, and you might expect that we would see that pretty easily, except that this could be 20 times as far away as Neptune is. The lights that we see from the planets is reflected from the sun, and if there is a ninth planet, it would be so far away from the sun that the light would be incredibly faint. The problem is that the most likely direction that we think this thing might be in, this hypothetical planet 9, is actually slap bang in the middle of the Milky Way, the most dense part of the sky as far as how many stars there are. How do you separate what could be a planet, a dim reflecting object in the night sky, from the many other background stars? Well, it moves relative to these background stars which, to our telescopes, essentially appear fixed. As it would take planet 9 between 10,000 and 20,000 years to orbit the sun, it could remain a distant mystery for years to come. We're looking for a needle in a haystack, for the needle looks like hay, that's why planet 9 hasn't been found yet. If it is there, Voyager is now the furthest object forged by humanity, and as such, they've given us the most distant photograph of our home. On February 14, 1990, it took a final image, turning its cameras back to the inner solar system and taking a panorama, a family portrait, if you will, of the entire solar system. And within one of the beams of sunlight, a tiny pale blue dot, the Earth, seen from the perspective of deep space. I think it made everyone stop and wonder a little bit just about how large the universe is and our place in it. Voyager 1 and 2 have both already entered into stellar space. There are a few ways to define the edge of the solar system. One is to say where does the influence of the sun end, and that would be called the heliosphere. Voyagers have passed that last remnant of our own solar system and continue into our larger galaxy. They have fuel that will probably mean that they can send signals back until maybe the mid-2030s. It's quite amazing that something launched back in the 70s could still be talking to us so far into the future. The Voyager probes carry with them a history of humanity as spacefaring explorers and the promise of future discoveries. It's the serendipitous discoveries as you go further and further into unknown territory which we look back on and say, ha, huh, didn't expect to see that. The depths of space called, and humanity answered. The Voyager spacecraft fundamentally changed our idea of what the outer solar system was like and showed us new worlds that beckoned to be explored. Our missions to the outer solar system have provided nearly half a century of milestones. You really felt part of it. Every decade of your life, you saw something new about our own solar system. The surveyor has opened up the possibilities of future missions. If we can actually go to Enceladus in the future, I think that will be an absolute watershed for our understanding of whether life could potentially exist in our solar system. These distant travelers are a monument to human exploration that makes all of the solar system and beyond a human place because that's how far we've gone. That's beautiful. This has got to be one of the most proud moments of my life, I guarantee you. As Apollo 17 prepared to depart the moon, astronaut Eugene Cernan gazed upon the Earth from a vantage point only 11 other men have shared, leaving a final footprint. He spoke captivating words to the world, receive foreign. Robotic probes were the first to touch the moon. Those first insights showed us that this was a world more fantastic than we could have dared to hope and worthy of further exploration. Eight years after the first man entered space, humanity stepped onto the lunar dust. It demonstrated we have a future that previously was not imagined. Scientific endeavors of Apollo continued to unlock the moon's secrets. The earth and moon have a common origin, so when we learn about the moon, we learn about our history. The race is now on to return once. Our fascination with the moon has always been profound. It has captivated us with its beauty and inspired generations to explore its mysteries. Scientists believe that the moon formed billions of years ago through a collision with a protoplanet. This collision caused debris to form a cloud, eventually coming together to create our moon. The race to explore the moon began with the launch of the first Earth-orbiting satellite by the Soviets in 1957. This was followed by the first human in space four years later. Robotic probes paved the way for human exploration. 
The Soviet Union's early successes were led by Sergei Korolev, their chief designer. Breaking free from Earth's gravity was a significant challenge, requiring immense technical developments. In 1959, Luna 1 became the first object to escape Earth's orbit, orbiting the Sun instead. The United States' first step towards the Moon was through the Pioneer Program, which launched probes to explore the solar system. Pioneer 4, launched in 1959, also ended up on a solar orbit. While the Soviets successfully reached the moon before the end of the decade, Luna 2 became the first object to impact the lunar surface, leaving debris scattered across it. It carried medallions with the Soviet coat of arms to symbolize their success and ideology. Luna 9, a few years later, became the first probe to have a controlled landing on the moon, transmitting secretive photographs to the world. The race to explore the moon continued with a surveyor program demonstrating the feasibility of soft landings. Surveyor 1, successfully landing on the moon, sent back images of itself as proof of its achievement. These missions aimed to understand the lunar terrain and identify possible exploration sites for both robots and humans. The moon has always held a special place in our hearts, and our deep curiosity and desire to explore it continue to drive our efforts to reach it once again. The surveyor missions were designed to explore the moon's environment, studying micrometeorite flux, radiation from the sun, and material behavior under different temperatures. These missions provided valuable data about the lunar surface. To explore the entire moon in detail, NASA needed satellites in lunar orbit. The Lunar Orbiter series of probes were sent to photograph almost the entire lunar surface, helping engineers and scientists pinpoint suitable landing sites for future missions. President John F. Kennedy's challenge in 1962 set the goal for America to land a man on the moon by the end of the decade. NASA's Gemini program served as a bridge between the Mercury and Apollo missions. Gemini missions aimed to test astronaut skills and endurance, practice rendezvous and docking procedures, and conduct spacewalks. The program provided valuable experience for the upcoming lunar voyage. The U.S. approach to reaching the moon involved careful planning and manageable steps. Gemini missions allowed NASA to work on different technologies and challenges in space. They also bought engineers time to design and build the Saturn V rocket, capable of carrying three humans to the moon. The development of the Saturn V rocket was led by German rocket scientist Wernher von Braun, who had been recruited by the U.S. government after World War II. The Saturn V rocket faced the challenge of balancing weight and speed to reach the moon in a few days. The rocket's enormous size and complexity never ceased to amaze. Meanwhile, its the Soviet Union's circumlunar change. mission plans were disrupted by the death of Sergei Korolev, their chief designer. The United States also experienced a setback when the Apollo 1 astronauts, Gus Grissom, Roger Chaffee, and Ed White, tragically lost their lives in a fire during a test. Despite these challenges and setbacks, the dream of reaching the moon persisted. The stage was set for America's Apollo missions to make history and fulfill President Kennedy's vision. Inside the Apollo 1 capsule, the atmosphere was pressurized with pure oxygen, which caused a fire to erupt. The astronauts were unable to escape because of the air pressure inside the capsule. As a result, all three astronauts tragically lost their lives. However, this tragedy led to significant improvements in safety measures. The door was redesigned for quick exits, vulnerable wires were coated, and fire safety measures were implemented throughout the cabin. The air mixture inside the capsule was changed to a combination of oxygen and nitrogen. After 18 months, the first humans were sent to the moon. Following the Apollo 1 fire, the next three Apollo launches were unmanned to ensure astronaut safety. In October 1968, Apollo 7 marked the first manned mission of the Apollo program. The crew demonstrated that astronauts could live and work in space for over a week in the command module. This mission also proved the safe re-entry of the command module into Earth's atmosphere. In the USFR, progress was being made as well. In September 1968, two tortoises were sent around the moon and safely returned to Earth aboard Zond 5. The Soviet Union was getting closer to their lunar dream. Apollo 8 was a significant mission. It aimed to orbit the moon, becoming the first mission to reach a distance where the Earth's gravitational pull was not the strongest. 
the trajectory had to be precise to be captured by the moon's gravity. Apollo 8 successfully circumnavigated the moon, providing the first glimpse of Earth rising above the lunar surface. This breathtaking view of our fragile planet inspired the environmental movement. Before the first moon landing, Apollo 10 served as a dress rehearsal. Astronauts practiced the descent towards the lunar surface but were not permitted to land. This ensured that they were prepared for the upcoming historic landing. Overall, these missions showcased the determination and ambition of both the United States and the Soviet Union in the race to the moon, with significant progress being made towards achieving this monumental goal. Moon, so the story, which is in some ways an urban myth and in some areas true, is that they didn't give them enough fuel on board the spacecraft, so they weren't tempted to make that final part of the descent. The fact that NASA didn't give Apollo 10 enough fuel to actually land and then safely take off suggests that they were aware of the allure of that first landing. Astronauts are near superhuman, but they're still human, so they might have been tempted. Those kind of missions paved the way for Apollo 11. Meanwhile, the USR was modifying their counterpart to the Saturn V to deliver humans to the moon. But on July 3, 1969, an explosion destroyed the rocket's launch pad. Soviet lunar exploration was relegated to their fleet of probes. For the U.S., the day was approaching. Years of technical development, engineering breakthroughs, and rigorous training all built to a single moment on July 16. Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins ordered Apollo 11 to break free from the Saturn V. The command module Columbia and lunar module Eagle continued toward the moon. Once the Apollo crew reached orbit around the moon, they then had the final challenge of getting onto the moon's surface. While Collins remained in orbit aboard Columbia, the evil descended to the moon. The astronauts were using an automated system on board, but the onboard radar was ticking off the distant rate until the computer started spewing out all these error messages. Those computers were actually heading the spacecraft towards a large boulder field so Armstrong took over the controls and had to fire the engines for longer periods of time. Fuel was starting to be used up at a much higher rate than projected. Houston Mission Control counted down the seconds of fuel they had left, and with only 16 seconds left, the Eagle landed. People around the globe witnessed this historic moment through a television camera that was placed on the surface after the landing module. Approximately 600 million people saw the images beamed across the world. Armstrong and Aldrin explored the lunar surface, while Collins attended to maintenance aboard America's Columbia and extended and beyond the first small care. step as Armstrong and Aldrin deployed scientific instruments and collected geological samples. They set up seismometers and measured the footsteps of the astronauts as they passed by. They'd also collected rocks, although they were told they didn't have enough samples yet. Today, those rocks are still being studied. As Armstrong and Aldrin completed their spacewalk, the Soviet spacecraft Lunar 15 attempted to land, but lost contact forever on its descent. The space race effectively ended. Less than a day after the Eagle landed, it was time to depart. President Kennedy's goal of getting a man to the surface of the moon and safely returning him to Earth had been accomplished. After successfully reuniting with Columbia, the Apollo 11 crew returned to Earth, splashing down in the Pacific Ocean. The USFR never came any closer to sending a citizen to the moon, but they persevered in developing machines for exploration. Rovers, like the Soviet Lunokhod one, have been successful in exploring the moon, allowing for longer travels and more interactive exploration. Apollo 12 carried the legacy of an earlier explorer landing near Surveyor 3, a previous robotic mission. The mission provided insights into lunar conditions with dust being identified as a potential problem for surface operations. The Apollo 13 mission faced a disaster when one of their oxygen tanks ignited, causing a loss of electricity, light, and water in the command module. The crew had to evacuate into the Aquarius lunar module, which was originally intended for their stay on the moon. The mission became a race against time to get the crew back safely. Apollo 14 successfully landed in the far more highlands, led by Alan Shepard, the first American to go into space. Shepard famously hit a golf ball on the lunar surface. The mission also discovered a four-billion-year-old rock, likely originating from Earth. 
With the Apollo 15 mission, the focus shifted to in-depth scientific exploration. The astronauts conducted three seven-hour spacewalks, collecting samples from 12 different locations. NASA also engineered the lunar rover, an ingenious transportation system that allowed for wider exploration. These missions showcased incredible achievements, with the lunar rover functioning spectacularly and adding a sense of fun to space exploration. Astronauts were able to go on longer journeys day after day. The Apollo 15 astronauts, using the lunar rover, explored diverse regions and collected geological samples, traversing 12.5 kilometers in a single spacewalk. Apollo 16 landed in the central lunar highlands, discovering rocks that were not formed from volcanic activity, challenging previous beliefs about the moon's history. Apollo 17 had a geologist as part of the crew and brought back tangible evidence of the moon's magnetic field and origin. The Apollo program transformed our understanding of the moon. Although political support and budget cuts led to the cancellation of future Apollo missions, the program's success contributed to our knowledge and understanding of Earth's natural satellite. The Apollo missions provided important scientific discoveries and technologies, such as reflector plates that enabled the development of GPS. Subsequent to the Apollo program, various nations and organizations have embarked on lunar exploration. Japan's Haiten and the European Space Agency's SSM Mark I satellites tested technologies and mapped the moon's surface composition. China's Chain program included the Chain 4 mission, which landed the first rover on the far side of the moon, revealing mysteries about the Aitken Basin and providing insights into the moon's history. The United States has also continued lunar exploration from orbit with missions like the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, LRO, and the LADE mission. These missions have contributed to our understanding of the moon and its resources. The moon's unique atmosphere, with no clouds and a lack of air, makes it ideal for scientific study using radar, infrared, and high-resolution imaging. The Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter has gathered extensive data and created high-resolution maps for future missions. Robotic exploration, like India's Chandrayaan-1 mission, has confirmed that the moon was once molten and discovered water ice in deep craters and near the poles. This discovery has significant implications for future human activities. Many nations and private industry are interested in returning to the moon to map out water resources and establish a sustainable human presence. Water can be used for fuel, sustaining lunar bases, and supporting missions to other destinations. NASA's Artemis program and companies like SpaceX are actively involved in lunar exploration, aiming to return humans to the moon and establish permanent bases.